Hey everybody, something a little different today. I interview Johnny Logan, who was a sensation back in the 80s and 90s in Ireland when he won the Eurovision contest, song contest, uh, three times. So kind of a record breaker. And people may be wondering now what's happened Johnny Logan and where he is. And uh, I think it's a great story. So particularly for the Irish and share with anyone who has an interest in this, please, this interview, a rare interview, uh, but also for anyone internationally, he has a great story of challenge and resilience uh, coming true to success again through dogged persistence and and great personal characteristics we also touch on lockdown and stuff like that but not too much so enjoy hey all something a bit different today and should be of particular interest to the irish uh, because i'm going to be interviewing johnny logan who was a music sensation way back in the day and he won the Eurovision Song Contest three times with What's Another Year, Hold Me Now, I think it was 87, uh, and then Why Me with uh, a different singer, but he composed it in 92. So huge sensation in Ireland and across Europe. And I'm delighted John Kiley, a mutual friend, connected us and we're going to go through the fascinating life that he's led and where he is now. So great to meet you, Sean. I know you go with the name of Sean now. Hi, uh, but it's really nice to meet you too. John, John uh, told me all about you, so I sort of, that's how we obviously we made contact. Yeah, John's a great guy, and you know, uh, we might talk He's towards the end about this. It's the same about you. It says the same about you. Ah, uh, yeah, well, I've been, I've been doing what I can to help. I have five children, so I've been trying to help people understand the last few years insofar as I can. But anyway, but you know what? We might start with going through that kind of heady, heady period, if you will, where all the success was happening and you became an absolute household name in Ireland. It's, you know, if I may, if I may interject, it's, it's kind of weird, you know, because when you're talking about the stuff, the 1980 with what's another year, hold me now, 87, 92, why me? Um, last week, the duet that I did over here with Andrea Berg went to number one in the first week of its release here. So it's the, I have the number, the, I'm on the number one album here in Germany now at the moment with the single, and Never Walk Alone from that. It's a, I wrote the lyrics, for the, the English lyric for it as well. So it's kind of fortuitousness at the age of 68. I said, it seems you'll ever, you're, this is a lesson to some of the younger people who are, you know, like sort of entering the music business, you're never too old, you know. Yeah, for sure. Well, congratulations. I wasn't aware of that, but I'm, I don't really know much in the music scene myself. I'm a different uh, kind of Makes more a nerd. Of, what is it? A great guitar player in Ireland said to me, he said, uh, I, you know, because I've seen some artists who are being very successful who I'm not really interested in musically. Not, no, no, no disrespect intended to them, but it's just not something for me. And uh, he, said, he said to me, um, yep, they're in the entertainment business. We're in the music business. And I think that kind of summed up the business that we're like sort of that surrounds us at the moment. Right. And you, well, we can circle back to those original days, but in the last years, you've been having most of your success and focusing around the Scandinavian countries because mm -hmm. they really resonated back in the Eurovision days. I think you built a big base. Well, it, it's been so weird. Uh, I've really, you know, like um, I, you know, like I, I'm lucky on like an awful lot of the singers that are based at home and the artists that are based at home in every country who are home based artists. Because of the Eurovision success, I, my success spread through the whole of Europe. And uh, when any, you know, like when anybody's looking for me in Scandinavia, Sweden, I work with Robert Wells and people like this and different orchestras over there. I'll shows like Al Sang Paskansen, Al Sang Pagrensen in on the border of Norway and Sweden. And um, whenever any work became available, I was available to do it because my office is here in Munich. It's my bureau. They like to call it the office here. And Tanya, my manager, is here. So I was lucky enough that I was able to be here and, um, you know, for part of the time and to flit in and out to my band are Danish. Uh, but to follow on from that, I mean, the second Eurovision that I won in, in 87 with Hold Me Now was in Brussels in Belgium. Um, well, last year I did The Mass Singer. I got an offer, which I couldn't understand, let alone refuse, to do The Mass Singer. And um, it was the exact same time as the Eurovision was held in Rotterdam. So I was able to, you know, take part in the Eurovision, you know, five, six TV shows. And then I was able to, you know, like spend six weeks in Antwerp 
doing the uh, the Mass Singer, and you know, like sort of so. And then a, a very good friend of mine a di- who died back in two thousand and five. Um, you probably understand these figures better than I do, but uh, he had over two hundred million downloads of his music in uh, Holland alone in the Neder- Netherlands. And his name is Andre Hazas, and they did a tribute show to him. And I did this, uh, you know, this show, and this kind of relaunched my career. The, all of these things relaunched my career in different territories. So now at the moment, I'm working again in Belgium. Uh, I've been doing, working with an orchestra, the Music Militaire, and uh, doing a jazz concert in Luxembourg. Tonight, I'm working, or I'm uh, going to um, Zwickau in East Germany. I'm working with the Folkland Philharmonic. It's also part of, which follows on from, it's also part of an answer, an answer to part of what you just uh, said. In Ireland growing up, when you played in the dance halls and the, you know, the show bands and stuff like this, you had to learn to sing everything, country and Western, rock and roll, everything, you know, like whatever was in the charts. So I'm working with a, a classic, I'm doing in uh, the next two days, I'm working with the Philharmonic doing classical Irish music like Danny Boy and She Moved Through the Fair with a Philharmonic Orchestra. I worked with a jazz orchestra. I worked with my band. You know, we did the Donor Insel Festival in Vienna. Um, I work with another band, with a big swing band in in Belgium, in Holland. And, you know, like sort of, and I'm writing my own stuff. And as I said, I co-wrote the song with Andrea Burke, who's one of the biggest female singers in Germany, which in the first week of its release, celebrating her 30th anniversary, it went to number one, but I am here. I'm in the middle of all of this. So I made, I was able to keep working as much as work was available during COVID. I mean, as you know, like I said, it was, it was difficult. It was really difficult, you know, like singing to at one, you know, like sort of different points, different rules came into place, which was very difficult to deal with. You know, you could go to a venue in, say, for instance, in Denmark, and they would allow 50% of the audience in and you sang for an hour and 40 minutes or an hour and 30 minutes with this audience. Then they left, they cleaned the theater and they brought in the second half of the audience. So you were basically doing two shows, being paid for one, but being two two shows and being grateful to be paid for one. Um, But they weren't allowed to sing along. They had to wear masks and they weren't allowed to, to stand up. And you know, like sort of if you're a performer and that's part of your life, it's really difficult, you know. I had to, and uh, initially when it came in, every the band realized very quickly they had to explain the rules of each different gig to me before we went on what you could do and what you couldn't do. But I, I'm very lucky that I'm very successful in so much as that, uh, you know, not just the Eurovision songs over the years, I've recorded so many different songs that have been well known that uh, when the televisions came up, um, came up, you know, like a uh, I was one of the few international artists who was available to go and be in places. And, you know, this is without going into what PCR testing was and flying and wearing masks and and having to bring documents to airport Mm -hmm. to prove, you know, like sort of who you were, where you were coming from, where you live, you know, and sort of all these kind of things. It became a, it was a nightmare, but it's a nightmare that I, that you had to either learn to live with or, you know, like, or just stop working. And there was no kind of financial, uh, there was no financial um, benefit at all from an artist's point of view to staying, and like to staying, to saying, okay, I'll wait until COVID's over. I had to keep on finding work, otherwise you're going to end up using money that you've made over the years. For God's sake, in The Masked Singer, I dressed as a reindeer. I mean, have I no pride, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Well... Whatever it takes, Sean, whatever it takes. But no, I, I find it a fascinating story of, of tenacity, uh, you know, coming back and getting so successful. And of course, persistence through COVID also, where you're absolutely right. You've got to find every way to make yeah. things happen. You'd need gumption. Um, and I was lucky. I, I seem to have been born with a lot of gumption. So I I persisted and strived all my life. It's the only way to live, in, in my opinion. This friend of mine, Jimmy Smith, is probably one of the finest guitar players we've ever had in Ireland. Jimmy said to me, um, it's amazing how lucky you are after all the years you've worked hard, you know. It's, you know, in other words, like, sort of luck just doesn't happen. You have to be in the right place at the right time. You have to keep on working and you have to keep pushing. And the thing is, you don't, and 
I've never been able to give up. You know, I'm 68 years old and I've never been able to stop, whether it's on stage or whether it's with, you know, what, you know, no matter how many times I get kicked and knocked down, I just get up and keep on moving forward. And that's, that's been my life. It's the only thing I've known. I don't, don't say that looking for kudos for it. I just say that is the reality of my life because, uh, you know, like I really appreciate the success, you know, that I have that I, and that I get more so because of all the times that I didn't have success. Absolutely. And you were just saying there about luck, couldn't agree more. So I think what's the phrase? Fortune favors the prepared mind. You know, you make your own luck essentially by always striving and then being in the right place when when the right thing or opportunity occurs. You know, I also believe, you know, I said, my mom and dad are up in heaven. I said, I said, and I do believe that uh, so is my little brother, two little brothers. One died when he was very young, and my younger brother, Eamon, who died a few years ago, and Eamon, um, I believe they're looking after me. They're like sort of the kind of guiding me and sort of, uh, you know, they're there for me. And like sort of, we were a very close, we still are a very close family. I, I take them on stage with me all the time, you know? Yeah, that's it. And, you know, having a spiritual side is so important, especially as the world moves more and more into a technocracy and we lose Ab- a lot of our traditions and our belief systems and we we embrace, you know, Al, you know the way the modern world is. Unfortunately, no, that's what we were saying before we did the interview. I, to a great extent, I don't because I, 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 it's not that I refuse to become part of it. I think I'm just too lazy. I've always been, when it's something that um, interests me, it gets 100% of my attention. But when it's something, you know, that I have to think about that is, you know, I have my, my middle son, uh, Fionn, who designs computer games and works with 3D. My eldest son, Adam, is involved with the in Kornigsdorf and, you know, like I said, they're very um, IT minded and, you know, up to date with computer, computer speak and all this sort of thing. Whereas my 30 year old son, Jack, is a guitar player, jazz guitar player, he, just a great guitar player. He's playing, uh, he, he's got a band that he plays with on the West Coast of Ireland, just did a musical and he's a phenomenal guitar player. But they've all got something from their mother that I don't have. And that's, uh, she was a school, she's a school teacher. And um, that's, that was her choice of career academic. And so what she's, what they have is they have this uh, ability to focus and to keep going. You know, with me and with my older brother, we just got to what we needed to do. And when we were good at doing it, that was enough. My sons are not like that. My sons just keep on going and they, you know, like to, they push themselves and they're they're dedicated and they have great focus. And I'm, I'm a big fan of theirs in this sense, really am. Mm. Absolutely. And it's great. I mean, it's a blessing to have children and to watch them develop for sure. I have five myself. And interestingly, Sean, I have no musical background whatsoever. I'm the other side of the brain. But my wife is majorly, she plays the accordion. She sings um, unaccompanied shannos in Irish. Absolutely. Well, she, probably, kids. she probably knows Ronan Brown and people like this. The guy, Ronan does a lot of work with me. He's a, an Ireland pipe player come in. Yeah. Uh, whistle player from the West Coast and is a great player. She'd probably know him. You know, what, what I tended to do, uh, um, like, this goes into another story. There was a point in my career, Ivor, where um, I felt, you know, I wasn't, music has leaving me behind because pop music, I wasn't interested in it. You know, a lot of the stuff, it's not that I didn't like it, it's just that it wasn't for me. It's, you know, like it didn't, uh, it, it, we, there wasn't a good match. So, um, this guy in Denmark asked me to make an album um, and he'd been asking me for years and uh, was say, would you do this? And he called call them Irish drinking songs like whiskey in the jar and Molly Malone. So I did it. And uh, you know, like, because I wasn't signed to a record company at one particular year and I recorded the whole album in eight days. First album I ever did, you know, completely sober as well. Just that's the one day. That was the point where I gave up alcohol. And, um, uh, the album was done in eight days. I did 14 vocals in one day and all the backing vocals the next day. And I co-produced it with my keyboard player. We needed to sell 12,000 records to cover the cost of making it, you know, of the video and of the photograph session and of the studio and the musicians. It sold over 350,000. It went to number one in uh, Norway for six weeks, double platinum, double platinum in Denmark, gold in uh, number one in Sweden. And that kind of relaunched my career. But in a different way, I had what's another year hold me now and why me to do the Eurovision stunts. But a lot of people were coming to concerts to see Whiskey in the Jar and, you know, like Black Velvet Band, etc. And um, 
so that became in in a period of about two years very difficult for me to join the two styles of music you know into a into a cohesive show so what i found was and this is where i take the thing about your wife playing the accordion and you know it's the shano singing i realized by the time i got to the second the irishman in america album um that there's a great similarity between um, Cajun, you know, the instrumentation on New Orleans and Cajun music to Irish music. So I started to fold uh, Irish, that's why I call the album Irish Man in America. It was kind of like a, a bridge between the two types of music. And I was using accordion, fiddle, uh, electric guitar, bass guitar, keyboards, Dr. John, you know, like sort of following, listening to people like Dr. John and, um, you know, like going back over my Little Feet albums and all these kind of things. And um, bit by bit, I got to the point where like every album I've done has been really successful. And now I have a, you know, a live show which is based on that type of music. I mean, my, my keyboard player plays accordion as well. We even play, we play rock and roll and all this sort of thing. But we play um, New Orleans kind of uh, with, you know, like sort of music with a New Orleans slant to it. And um, it's uh, it's really, when when you get into music, in the sense that you're, you feel like you're creating something, that you're, uh, you're not just making a record, you're actually sort of thinking about what you're doing, the instrumentation on the records and all this. Stuff. It becomes a really, really, in, you know, like it, it inspired me to find a, a new interest within music that I didn't know existed, basically. And that's led me to where I am now and kept my, you know, kept me right at the front of it. Excellent. That's it. Blending and bringing the past into the present, yeah. kind of modernizing a little. Sounds fantastic. Uh, or in my world of problem solving, be kind of integrating is the word I'd use. Yeah. But, you know, the kids, the beauty of my wife being all uh, ex or has expertise in that. I've got uh, the kids doing classical piano up to grade eight, uh, really? violin similarly, the other girl. Uh, and also accordion, and one even picked up banjo, which I love. I love the sound of banjo. I use banjo on some stuff as well, because I love the sound of it, you know. But the thing is, um, it, music in general, and this relates to the COVID and the thing that looks at this. I used to believe, um, Ivor, that uh, music was a luxury item. You know, that's because it always felt to me like sort of people needed a place to live. They needed food on the table. They needed you know, drink, they needed like sort of um, clothing and this sort of thing. But during COVID, I, I, it kicked the shit out of me in this sense. And I, I, I realized my brother was very sick. He's still isolating in Manchester with heart problems. My sister in Australia had cancer, which she recovered from. Hopefully she's still in, like I said, she's still being tested, but they, she's 100% cured, they said. But um, there was absolutely nothing I could do. And music helped me get through all it, you know, get through personal loss. There was a moment that I was working with Robert Wells, a wonderful piano player, classical piano player from uh, Sweden, but he plays boogie woogie and rock and roll like you would not believe. Just an amazing musician. And he wrote a song called Window to the Past. And uh, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a version of it, a black and white video where he just plays it with piano. But if you Google that and you find that, you'll find an orchestral version underneath it of him playing Windows of the Past with an orchestra. That's the one to listen to. And I sat on, it was during the gig and I was with the guest, one of the guest artists on it. And I sat on the side of the stage or stood on the side beside the sound desk. And I listened to him, the song, and it's just got this incredibly beautiful move, movement in it and very simple. But what it did for me was it brought me to the past. It just opened a little window and I looked back over my life, over the Eurovisions, the, the, my, my parents, my family, you know, moments in my life, losing my members of my family, the birth of my children, the sort of the, you know, like moments in my life that, that really marry, you know, you know, falling in love, all of these kind of things. And this, how wonderful my wife had been to me and all these kind of things. Just, but it all happened within four minutes. It was like a window to the past. And... When the song finished, I hadn't realized, but I stand floods of tears. And I just remember, like, sort of, I wasn't embarrassed. The guys were just kind of, the guys, the sound guys putting their arm around me. They thought I was upset about something. But I remember looking up and just thinking, sort of, what a life. What a fucking life. You know, this, you know, this is, I should, instead of worrying about this, you know, like, sort of, what's coming next, I should just be so grateful for what I've, what I've had. 
And that was a wonderful lesson to me to realize how important. The music had opened that window for me. You use music to say goodbye to somebody. You use music to welcome people into your life. When your children are losing, you know, playing music, they'll have, a, they'll have an understanding of their, their own hearts even better. They'll understand, you know, like sort of, it, it helps to open, open your heart to different things in life. There was a moment that I was, you said something about like sort of this, you know, what, what you need, some spiritual and, you know, like how important that is in your life. I did a, I came from some run of gigs in, in Europe and I got back and I had a gig down in Killarney for a tourist company in the Hotel Europa. And they gave me the suite on the fifth floor. I was really, they really spoiled me. They gave me the suite and I was able to, you know, two big wicker chairs sitting there on the balcony. And when the gig was finished, thankfully it went really, really well. I went to, I sat out on the balcony and I just looked at the lakes of Killarney and the darkness and the sh shadows moving. And I called my wife and I just said, I don't want to, you know, I want to stay here. I knew I had to go to a meeting in Limerick the next day, a, a tax thing and this sort of thing. But it just, it was the first time in years and all through COVID and it's, that just real peace, just, I felt real peace inside. And I think that that's, uh, you know, that's, that's something that music brings to you as well. It brings you that peace when nothing else will. And, uh, you know, especially if you, if you love it, you know, yeah. a lot of people do music to be famous. It means nothing. I mean, fame, is, fame will get you a better table in a restaurant, get you to the top of a queue, you know, so that sometimes it'll help you, you know, like sort of um, when you're booking things. But, you know, sort of what really matters is uh, what, what is lovely is, I mean, I was in the Munich Centre yesterday, two uh, little ladies. I was uh, buying a mask of all things because you still have to wear them on the trains and that. Two little ladies that sort of looked at me and said, it was Johnny Logan, Johnny Logan. And I thought to myself, I was 18 years old. I was working like an I was working as an electrician in Arbor Hill Prison. I hadn't gotten arse in my pants. And here I am, 68 years old in Munich. And people recognize, you know, recognize me. Say, You're number one in the charts. You're fake. You know, so that I, love, I love your music, you know. It's been a long journey, but it's been a wonderful one, you know. And I have to thank music for it. And, I, I undervalued music most of my life. I won't make that mistake again. Yeah, no, that's superb, superb words there, Sean. And, you know, I'll just pick up on one thing there. Yeah, the, the response, the human kind of connection to music in all the life events that you mentioned. I interviewed Matthias uh, Desmet a few weeks ago. Um, he has a new book, The Psychology of Totalitarianism. It's quite technical in ways. Uh, but he ended up the interview with that, that we can have all the rational and the scientific and my whole world, basically. But at the end of the day, humans uh, resonate. They're like stringed instruments yeah. and something beyond all the facts and the data. Uh, we, we perform at a different level. We resonate. And it was a similar point that, you know, when music comes in, even someone who's non-musical like me, emotions well up in the right scenario with the right music they have a profound effect even on a hardcore rational logical kind of person like me you know that's look, our, the, the, an, an example i dare anybody to listen to adagio for string samuel barber without being moved you know instead of you don't have to understand it just listen to where it takes just go go with the music let it take you where it goes it's just un unreal Absolutely. And just picking up on the, again, we don't want to dwell too much on the, on the COVID, but I know John particularly has been affected by that. Uh, John Kiley, who connected us. But just to give an example of, of, of facts and science, Sweden, and you're big in Sweden and Scandinavia, Sweden ran the whole pandemic with no lockdowns, no masks, and kids up to 16 in school. And they're an aged demographic like the UK and the density of their cities, many of them match Manchester and Birmingham. So there's no real difference there. But Sweden achieved around half of the extra mortality due to COVID that the UK experienced. So, you know, this believe is, it or not. Yeah, I, know, I, I follow what you're saying, but like for me, the, the whole thing about COVID was nobody knew. Nobody knew what we were dealing with. So like... My attitude right from the very beginning and uh, still to this day is I do just, you know, like I listen to people who are, um, who I, I believe are, you know, like knowledgeable in the field that they're in. 
like sort of when you would talk to me about like what you do, I would listen to you and this sort of thing. And and the thing is that um and I would just I obeyed the different rules in every different country I was in. People handled it the best way they could. I think that's a basic difference between John and myself. John felt that he John feels that, that he watched uh, the internet and he got all the different information from all the sides. I didn't feel that at all. I thought my job was to um you know to try and uh, look after my neighbours, look after my fellow people, my fellow human beings, and to obey the rules and do and, and sort of. And thankfully, now we're in the situation where I don't wear a mask, you know, like sort of, and I can get on the plane. Lots of planes. Some planes still have mask mandates. Still wear them because they're they're mask they they're the, they're the mandates. Even though when you climb off the plane, the minute you get off the plane, you take the mask off and you walk, you know. But there's there's loads of moments like that. But I don't think anybody was. Uh, my my honest belief is I don't believe anybody was trying to fool us or whatever. I just think people made judgment calls and did the best they could. And, you know, mm -hmm. I've made so many mistakes in my life that um, I won't sit in judgment over other people who have made mistakes. And that's, no, that's a fair approach to absolutely, Sean. And, you know, the interesting thing is, and again, I interviewed the guy, the psychology of totalitarianism goes through it all and a phenomenon called mass formation a kind of form of hypnosis, like going back to the witch trials and the French Revolution, it, the same phenomenon occurs in large crowds, especially with social media. But the really interesting thing is that on my website alone, I have 53 published scientific papers from scientific teams, and all of them show that lockdown has no measurable effect on the outcome for COVID. And masks are similar. And you know, the interesting thing is, just to mention that the first one I got was published in April 2020 from Woods Hole Institute, did a cross Europe analysis and showed clearly that lockdown. I'll stop you there. There's a band called the Gibson Brothers. I did a gig oh. with them in Belgium as COVID started. Um, Patrick, the youngest brother, died of COVID, one of the first people to die in Belgium of COVID. So I had it right in my face from the very beginning. Um, um, I dealt with it the way I felt I dealt with it, with the best way to deal with it in conjunction with my family. And I know we can look at all the things logically during or even afterwards, but uh, I made my decision. It's not something that, I, you know, that, I'm, that I'm never going to go back over and say, like, that, I could have done better or this could have been done yeah. better. It's, it, no. it's uh, like trying to put, uh, you know, like the um, toothpaste back in the, in the, in the, uh, the tube that's the word i was yeah. looking for tube. oh no absolutely and sorry to hear that sean and it, it was overwhelmingly more uh, aged frail and the average age was 80 but certainly there were younger people so i think it's more about learning so going forward we could uh, manage it a lot better perhaps rather than looking back for sure do you think with human beings and the history we've had as human beings we're going to learn anything <laughs> I think I said, some people may, you may, some people may, but um, all I have to do is look at Ukraine to realize we've learned nothing. Yeah. Well, I, I said that to be positive, and in a sense, I, I do unfortunately agree it's a negative thing, but yeah, we're very bad at learning from history. And, and retrospectives, uh, and in my corporate career as well, when things were political, if you make huge mistakes and it's estimated now lockdown policies had 20 to 30 times more damage to human population than they ever saved no one's going to want to go back and acknowledge that because the damage created was just too enormous again you know like um this is uh, we'll have to agree to just this is something i don't really want to talk about because yeah, yeah. um i i have my own beliefs about this and you know I, as i said i believe everybody did their best you know their best to get through things you know, sort of, and it's um, people made mistakes. Yes, I'll agree with that. And <laughs> including some, you know, like sort of putting someone like Boris Johnson in charge of, of the bus, you know, like sort of this. But, you know, like sort of those are, you know, Donald Trump in charge of the bus. There are things that sort of I feel very strongly about. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like I also, and I've always, I've had this conversation with John as well. I respect his, his right to have his own opinion, but I have mine. Absolutely, John. Absolutely, for sure. And you know what? Um, we didn't dwell much, though you did touch on it at the challenging times. And I'm always interested. I've, I've managed people and teams of people for 20 years, HR management effectively. But the challenges people have, you went through some tough times. So if you're OK with just maybe touching on that and talking and how you came out of it. Well, basically, you know, like sort of this, you know, you, like, I remember Shay Healy saying to me after the second Eurovision, after Hold Me Now, 
He says, you're a great man, Sean. Says, uh, you know, you went through those seven years from 80 to 87, and you're still the same person that you were when you start. <laughs> I wasn't the same person at all. Um, it had affected me in every possible way, you know, sort of I'd, um, you know, I was battered by the newspapers. that I had no peace. It affected my family. It affected me physically. You know, um, I was very gaunt. I'd lost um, a huge amount of weight. Um, and then uh, I managed to keep it all together. And then we got through the second second Eurovision. And then uh, we got to a point where um, in, 90, uh, in 93, my father died. And that was the first lo loss that I had, personal loss. And it just spiraled out of control. I'd always drank a lot more than most people because we had a problem when we were young. I think Irish people in general, you only realise when you leave Ireland that we drink more than other, you know, other people from different countries, you know. And for us, it's normal, you know, like sort of to have a, you know, to go out for a, a party in a pub or whatever and drink quite a bit. And there's nothing wrong with that if you can do it, you know. But the thing was, I was going onto a stage and I was, you know, singing and I was trying to travel and this sort of thing. And it just, my, um, my, Alcohol abuse kind of just uh, spiraled out of control. And um, this went on for a while. And my weight started fluctuating. And I was like, sort of, uh, you know, one day you'd be, you'd starve yourself and you'd still be drinking, sort of, you'd be, so your weight would be up and down. And eventually, sort of, I was quite bloated and this sort of thing. And, I, and then uh, I started getting these kind of panic attacks. And, um, uh, you know, like, sort of, um, it all became too much. And I remember I came back from Scandinavia to back to Dublin and um, I went up to my GP and I said, I'm not feeling good. And he said, here's an envelope. He said, uh, gave me this brown envelope. He said, drive up to Toronto, to the hospital. I went up and they put me in the intensive care unit for five days. Wouldn't let me, took my phone away and everything. I had no clothes, nothing. Just put me on a bed and wired me up. And my heart rate was fibulating really high, you know, so I 187 to 196 or something. And I, I was worried about my mother hearing about it back in Ireland, you know, my, my parents worrying about me and this sort of thing. So I tried to keep it quiet. And that's kind of an example of what the newspapers can do. Uh, one of them uh, hung, hung, hung out in the hospital or whatever, got the story and printed in the front page of one of the newspapers, you know, like sort of from somebody in the newspaper, like sort of, and uh, that, of course my mother found out about it. And then that made things worse because you know what mothers are like, you know, Oh, oh. Why didn't you tell me? Why there's me like sitting with my heart and fibulous. Why didn't you tell me? Winding me up twice as much. But cut a long story short, I made a decision. I got, I said, uh, I talk with my GP, talk with my family, and I said, right, well, this is, uh, I'm going to stop drinking. I said, I'm going to stop on the third of January. And I remember sort of saying, why are you going to stop on the third? I said, well, I'm going to get pissed after the gig on New Year's Eve, and then sort of I'll be over the next day. So that's the first I'll be hung over on the next day, sort of traveling back. So I'll have a few drinks on the plane and drinks with the family I get back. And then I'll, on the second, I'll have a couple of drinks just to, to then equal, um, equalize my broad, my body. Well, I said of this. And then I said, and, but I'll stop on the third. That's 17 years ago. I went wow. into camp. I went, uh, I was lucky enough to find a great man. Um, and I, well, he wouldn't appreciate me giving his name, but he gave me, books, you know, like they gave me books to read about the, uh, not big, big long books or whatever, but just books about um, alcohol abuse and this sort of thing. And for two years, I went to counselling and I said, uh, sat with him, talked through, and it turned out that I wasn't an alcoholic. It was, uh, I had a lot of emotional and, you know, like a lot of problems that were left over through all of the revisions and the up and downs and all these sort of things in between it. And, uh, you know, like sort of I pretended from the point of view to the press and this sort of thing that it didn't hurt, but it really hurt. And it really broke mm. my heart many times and not just me, but worse again was my family, the damage it was doing to them. So uh, I'd made a decision. I also wanted to show my boys who I was without alcohol. I wanted to show them the kind of man that their father was, not just uh, not to see this party animal or this, you know, these three times Eurovision winner. That wasn't enough. I wanted them to see their father. And, um, now we have a, a very honest and open relationship with my boys and sort of them. Um, and uh, as I said, 17 years later, I've had a number one album that not Coldplay off number one. I remember being in Spain and it was in the Irish album, The Irish Connection. 
I got a phone call on the beach in Spain. Said you're number one in Spain. Like you're number one all over Scandinavia. I went, Are you sure you have the right Johnny Logan? <laughs> My album was all Irish music. Was, no, no, you're number one, and you've just gone platinum. Now, are you really sure you have the right Johnny Logan? And it just got better and better. The sales just kept, and that kind of relaunched my life. And I, then I went on a very positive thing. And I think uh, one of the things about, I mean, not drinking doesn't mean you don't have problems. Does doesn't mean you don't get hurt. Doesn't mean you don't have disappointment. It just allows you to deal with it a whole lot better. Yeah. And uh, you know, I find that I'm, um, I find that I'm a very focused person. That I find, I find, I, I know who I am. I don't need uh, any reaffirmation of that. I don't need anybody, you know, uh, telling me that you're like sort of, um, you know, like sort of you, you know, you're, you're grateful, massing, or, as the Americans say, blowing smoke up your ass and this sort of thing. And it's made me a much better artist. It's made me a much more human artist, much more. Um, uh, I have much more connection with my audience when I'm singing to them and when I'm talking to them. I don't try to be above them or beneath them. I just try to be, you know, like sort of um, who I am to, for them. And that's uh You'd be surprised how many years it took to learn to do that, you know. Yeah. And, no. you know, the bravery that I had, the biggest part of the bravery that I had in giving up alcohol was to go on stage without drinking. That became, um, that was very hard for for uh, for the first few years. And in, in the middle, you know, in the middle of the, uh, yeah, it didn't go away. In the, uh, you know, I still, I'm, I'm a very nervous person anyway when I sing. I still pray and I still sort of, uh, like sort of, um, before I sing and I, I, my heart goes into, you know, dum, 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 dum. but within 30 seconds when I'm out, bang, it's, I'm at home on the stage. But the reality of it is that, uh, you know, um, I also had a situation where I was playing with an orchestra in Holland called the Kornlicht Orchestra. And I had a po polyp on my vocal cords. And I don't know what you know what this is. I've, you know, I know you know what it is, but I don't know. From a singer's point of view, what happened was the falsetto disappeared. So when I went to hit a high note, the end of what, you know, what's not here, just air came out sometimes, not all the time, sometimes. And what I was doing was the, the Irish cure. I'll take a couple of bottles of wine before I go on. That'll, you know, that'll loosen the voice and I'll be able to sing. But it didn't work. And eventually uh, I got a doctor in, um, in uh, The Hague and he operated and removed the polyp. And um, 10 days later, I was singing with the orchestra again. I had to be careful. I had to learn to talk again. They put a speech therapist with me. And now I sing better than I ever sang before. But it's again, wow. it was it was an uphill struggle. And it was a mental battle, you know, like for about a year, you'd be singing and your voice, your voice would dry out in the middle of a song. And um, you wouldn't know, you know, just it would just disappear. Okay, you don't know what the fuck is happening, but that's over now. And, you know, I'm singing much better than I ever sang before. I learned to use my diaphragm. I learned to, you know, like sort of, you know, to... To, uh, oh, to create yeah. wind and all of this. I create, uh, I control the voice through my vocal cords, but also through my head voice. You know, I've got diff loads of different uh, sounds that I can use on my vocal cords. And um, and uh, I can bring more to the music than I ever had before, because I also bring an appreciation of the voice that I never had before. Excellent. You know, tenacity, gumption. And I believe that from that story, you pushed your luck a little going back singing a little earlier than they recommended. Well, that was that was ridiculous. Uh, you know, it's, I didn't I said 10 days. But if I there was a gig four days later after the uh, the operation and they said, um, you know, like sort of, well, you know, we'll have to you're at the star of the show. There were artists on it, but I was the top top star. I said, well, there's 67 people in the orchestra. Nobody would be able to work. You know, all the, the rigging crew, the backstage crew, all the other artists. They didn't say this to me, but I knew it. And I said, they said, could you sing even a couple of songs on the show? And I said, OK, um, I'll speak with my doctor. And uh, the doctor said, OK, well, the speech therapist and himself came to the gig. And uh, they, um, they were both backstage with me. And I sang four four songs and I sang them better than I'd sung them <laughs> on any of the shows previously, which was amazing. But uh, after the show, the next day I went to the airport because they gave me seven days at home, which is what I really, really needed back with my family and this sort of thing. And um, I, uh, I remember that they'd written on a piece of paper. I just had an operation. A polyp has been removed and I can't talk. And I thought it was so funny when you're checking in with the airport, you know, you give the, the note to the girl 
like, you know, like I, I've had the operation, I can't talk. And she'd go, is everything okay? They would whisper to you. They wouldn't talk, you know, there's nothing wrong with your voice. It's my voice. It's, you know, like I have to protect. But, you know, I, I, it's another, it was another battle that I had, another fight that I had and I won it. That, that's it. Winning is everything. Well, obviously, unless winning means being bad to people, but in the good stuff, yeah, no, for sure. It's not in my, not in my nature either. I, I see that, that that resonates all through this conversation, uh, Sean, I must say. And I'm a pretty good uh, judge of people from my past background. But, you know, just a quick word on the alcoholism. It's a huge problem. During lockdown, particularly, I went overboard. Now, not to the extent that you're referring to, but I actually realized I had to change something. Now, I didn't completely give up, but I switched from wine, which I love, and I switched to Smithix, which is no wheat, low alcohol. And it's mostly water. Kilkenny. And Kilkenny, that's where my mother, yeah. My came from. My mother, that's my grandfather had seven All Irelands playing for Kilkenny. So when yeah, I drank, you mentioned, yeah, that, that, thing. that was my drink too. But I switched the other way around, Smithix to wine. Yeah, well, I switched from Smithix originally to that, but I had to go back. So now I have a couple of beers, a lot of water, very low alcohol, and my work is way better the next day, even though I wasn't. Yeah. You look healthy enough to me. I like to. You look like enough. I wish I was as healthy as you, man. But you know, yeah, this, I'm, I, I'm only I, fifty-three, not sixty-eight. <laughs> this, but there's, you know, my the, the the guy who did the counselling with me. His first name is Roland. That's all I tell did this. But Roland said to me one day, he said, you, you know, like so you should write a song about the dangers of alcohol. You know, like so the like abuse. I said, that's. I said I I would feel completely wrong writing that because there's nothing wrong with alcohol. There's nothing wrong with having a drink enjoying yourself with a drink it's only you know i was abusing it you know that's and, and i felt the problem was not the bottle the problem was me and that's mm. what sort of you know that's uh you can write a song about that but that's um you know like you have to be very careful when you message something that you put the blame in the right place and the thing is that it was uh it was my go-to for dealing with any problem in my life and that's the thing that uh so I, i've never done that you know like sort of because I, I'm, I'm not going to sit in judgment of anybody of anybody with a problem. Yeah, so important. And the trouble you have with the media, I kind of resonate with that too. I've had a little bit of problems there. They're they're pretty sick over the last 10 or 20 years. It's, and um, You get there some really good ones. You know, I made, a, I kind of went to a pit pen where I wouldn't do an interview. I wouldn't even do an interview and, and talk to anybody and no disrespect to yourself either I've anything like this. But um, Barry uh, Egan, I had a long talk with him, um, with, uh, he's a journalist in Dublin. And Barry said, look, Sean, says, this, this is crazy. They said this thing about, you know, hating all journalists or not having anything to do with any of them. He said, uh, you know, I said, the reality of it is that that's, you're better off just to say when you're doing an, an interview, I'm not answering that question. You know, instead of, I, it's, I got myself into trouble by allowing people to get to me because it's some, sometimes wearing my heart in my sleeve. And I think, if they got to me, I would say things, you know, that I didn't mean, you know, like sort of you get bitchy or like, you know, but it wasn't the anger would be directed at someone that's in, in an opposite, in a direction, not towards the journalist, towards someone else. Because, uh, but I eventually, and I found that um, I've had terrible experiences with them and with my family over the years. So I'm still, I would be very careful. I much prefer to do an interview like this where you can hear what I'm saying and it's my voice that's saying it. And, you know, like sort of this and, uh, because a lot of times in the newspapers, they misquote you. I mean, my brother, Michael, had a heart attack, my older brother. And this idiot of a journalist in Ireland put it in the newspaper like he'd done an interview with him or an interview with me about the... He didn't do any interview with me at all, but he, he wrote his, an article like he'd done an interview with me about my brother's heart attack. I would never talk about my family private, my private matters like that. And he's an asshole and he'll remain an asshole the rest of his life, you know, instead of and. Uh, Unfortunately, you'll just grow bigger, you know? <laughs> Essentially, uh, the world is full of them. But you're right, there are some good journalists still. But if, I've been through so many, and I, I'm pals with Eddie Hobbs and, and a couple other media guys, and they helped me a little bit, even though I'm a corporate guy, so I was pretty good. They still caught me out where I gave very clear answers, and they cherry-picked sub-clauses of sentences and framed them in a certain way to make it... You know, and technically it's not illegal. They are, a lot of them are scum. <laughs> yeah, I know. But then, you know, look, what I've had to 
admit to myself as well is that there are some really good journalists and and they're like sort of it's like sort of uh, some shit singers they like sort of don't give all the great all great singers a bad name you know this is so you got to think of it in that terms you know like there are you know I still re enjoy reading a good book you know so there Absolutely. are great writers out there you know yeah for sure yeah and i was always a big reader and it's a great way to get through your youth and and to always be learning is to read a lot much better than just watching stuff on a, on a screen I, I tend to read biographies and uh well i tended to and when i tend to you know like these days i don't have very much time at all honestly and i think um when i when i go on holiday i use what uh, they call my home my my meditation tape just to you know slow the heart rate and Close, close the eyes and breathing, the breathing techniques, all this sort of stuff, with a voice talking to me all the time. But yeah. I think, um, you know, everything in this world has its place. Just uh, I think um, we could do with a whole lot more honesty and a whole lot more good heart in this world. Absolutely, for sure. And that's that's a great way. I know we're kind of wrapping to a close anyway, but but what you just said, uh, I agree a thousand percent. And well, that's a cliche, I know. But anyway... You know what? Uh, I make but, but, but sure nothing that... wrong with a good cliche. Uh, I, 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 nothing wrong with a good cliche. No, there's a lot of true cliches, and and uh, they're well worth repeating, nonetheless. Uh, the other thing is, I want to make sure I'm going to put down just for the audience the links to your music, uh, your shows, your tours, and all that. So I'll make sure I follow up with Tanya and, and just get all the links where people can find you, because many people in Ireland and elsewhere may have lost track of you and not realised. To be honest, Sean, like I. I had not realized you were booming and touring and doing musicals, concerts and albums uh, all across Europe. Uh, so, so there you are. Tanya's great. Tanya's like sort of, um, I learned years ago that whenever I'm in any relationship, business, you know, working relationship, whether it's with my accountant, with my, you know, with my manager or whatever, I have to have a very um, friendly relationship. I'm not a person who can work with a stranger, you know, like sort of this, it's got to be sort of like so they can tease me, they can, and they and they do, and this sort of thing. But um, and Tanya's a great manager, and um, she'll give you all the information you need. Uh, this is, um, I, you know, I've had uh, three and a half months on the road. This year is turning into be probably the busiest year I've ever had, um, <clears throat> because all the reschedule work from three years, you know, has been loaded in. You know, it's all happening now, plus all the new shows. And, um, you know, with the new hit record and this sort of thing as well, that's going to make things even more complicated from the diary's point of view. But um, we do our best to keep, and we do our best. I'm useless. Tanya does her best to keep the fans informed and everybody informed about what's happening. And I do my best to keep my family informed. Excellent, Sean. Uh, that's, this has been such a great conversation and such a welcome change from my usual kind of metabolic and scientific stuff. This was much more real, if you will. You would have lost, would have lost me halfway through, man. <laughs> yeah. thanks, thanks so much, Sean. And we'll talk again. Say hello, hello to your family for me, Ivan. And uh, tell, your, tell your wife to keep the children's piano, uh, music lessons up, you know. <laughs> will do. Very, <laughs> very nice talking to you. You're a very nice man. Oh, you absolutely yourself too. Thank you, Sean. Thank Bye you very now. much, Ivan. God bless, man. Bye-bye now. Hope you enjoy that, guys, and please do subscribe here to the channel and hit the notification bell, very important, uh, and share, of course. And the links to uh, the various things we discussed uh, are down below, uh, and also the links to support me. So huge thanks to all the people out there who support me in bringing interviews with scientists, doctors, analyzing data in the world's most important issues in health etc uh, and getting truth and reality out there uh, and of course other interviews with people increasingly that are not just focused on on the health sphere so thank you